All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody to this edition of the Metaversal Minute. I'm your host, Richard Boyd. Uh, as always, you can follow me on Metaversal on Twitter and on other channels. Uh, my guest today is Ken Lane, a colleague who has been working with me since the turn of the century, I like to say. No. <laughs> so we've been, uh, and, and the topic today is the metaverse and digital twins. So Ken, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself and uh, what you think, uh, or what do you think of this whole digital twin phenomenon? Sure thing. I'm Ken Lane. I'm the CTO of Tanjo, and uh, I've been figuring out uh, how uh, you can connect uh, what people want to understand with uh, the data that's out there. And uh, they've been up to that for about 25 years now. And uh, so I've, I've got a lot of uh, lumps on my forehead and uh, successes under my belt um, trying to get that done. And, and I, I love this new phrase, digital twins. Um, it is uh, redo, re, rehashing a lot of the concepts that uh, uh, Richard and I have been up to for about 25 years. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing there is that um, folks are taking uh, video game technology, which is paid for by all of those kids on sofas, thank you for their thumbs and efforts and dollars. Um, so the billions of dollars of investment in technology is also being used for serious purposes. For a while, we called those serious games, right? We had simulation training. Um, and what we would do is we would use video game technology and we would teach people stuff, help people visualize things, take very complex information and arrange it in a 3D space with simulation, importantly. And lo and behold, there's a lot of virtuous things you can communicate. Digital Twins is kind of a new buzz phrase that's wrapped around this idea. Um, and uh, so it's interesting that we're, uh, we're allowed to use this technology with a new pair of words. Yeah, so as I mentioned at the outset, you and I met many years ago. I'm, I've got a little graphic here in my little Wayback Machine. We'll see if this pops up. Does this look familiar? So, yeah, so yeah. we actually back, you know, we had this Virtus Entertainment uh, umbrella and we created all these game companies with Tom Clancy. Red Storm Entertainment is one most people know about did games with Douglas Adams and Michael Crichton, but we acquired your little company from the West Coast, right? You were in, where, where were you in West Coast? I was in Santa Cruz, California. Yeah, at, because I had a garage, I was required to grow a ponytail and start a company. So I did, and Virtual Alchemy uh, was bought by 3D Solve. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, it was the Virtus Entertainment Group, and we formed 3D Solve right after that as this little chart shows. Uh, but now, you know, I wanted to dig into a couple of the, uh, of the digital twin projects that we worked on in the path and uh, in the past. Uh, specifically, you know, we did a digital twin of an entire army brigade, right? So I want to talk about that one, and I want to talk about the submarine, which was really cool. Those two projects are probably the main reason why Lockheed Martin bought our company uh, back in 2007. And that was that was 3D Solve, and I'll, I will point out for the audience that in that in the second year that we were in this 100-year-old company with 130,000 employees uh, called Lockheed Martin. If you don't know them, they make spaceships and and fighter jets. Uh, but Ken here was the technologist of the year in our second year there. So uh, so I'm really proud to to have you here, and it's been great working with you for the last uh, couple of decades. But let's talk about first this. Uh, let me see if I can find the little, this is just a little slide on it. Hopefully that's showing up in the recording here. We had this uh, project where uh, folks at the Architecture Integration Management Directorate, that is a real place at Fort Monroe, Virginia, where, you know, they would go to the Pentagon and they would try to figure out, you know, in a brigade combat team of 15,000 units with all of its equipment and and it's it's uh, weapons and and communication systems and vehicles and everything like could you give this person a, a radio or could you give that person this commun uh, communications equipment or this vehicle or this weapon system and there's all these business rules that govern it so just talk a little bit about how we did that and uh, what was unique about that at that time and that was like 2004 or 5 right 
That's right. So uh, back back then, you didn't pick up a game engine. You wrote one from scratch. And so that's what we did. Um, so you see 3D there. Um, you start from a blank page and a bunch of code. Nowadays, it's a lot easier. You kind of hop in there and you uh, spin up your copy of Unity or Unreal, and then you start. Um, so it's, it's luxurious today. <laughs> um, but in, in this solution that we had, the the, the we army... probably had GPUs back then, didn't we? Or because yeah. I know there was a time we were doing games when you couldn't even count on a GPU. We didn't even trust Microsoft to draw to the screen, right? <laughs> yeah, we we did we coded it both ways, to, uh, both because uh, not a lot of folks had them, but if you did, it was great. Um, now now you better. Um, but in in this solution, we we uh, the army had this architectural data right the operational view hierarchy and it was all um, in a database a bunch yeah. of databases right that's right and and uh surfacing all that information such that it could be understand under uh, the understanding could be pulled out of that database and handed off to the poor souls who are trying to present it and make decisions based on it that that was key but you know imagine a database where you've got Every, in in an entire brigade or uh, or theater of operations, you've got every person, every role they play, every training they could have, every training they did have, everything they could say, everything they did say, everything that they could say that thing through, like a radio or teletype or text or computer, every single piece of that equipment. Yeah engaged in a simulation and wire that together so thoroughly that you can make decisions and, and that's what we were able to achieve yeah i remember that the classic example was the nine line brief right the when you're when you have a guy on the ground who sees a bad guy and is trying to call a fast mover a fighter jet to come in uh and hit and, and it's all this communication and choreography that has to happen among all these units so we don't kill people uh, and I recall one of the episodes we tried to play out in this simulated world was the Pat Tillman uh, sort of scenarios, like trying to avoid our our guys from getting hurt from friendly fire. Um, and I'm just remembering now that this was all in a seat. This was all in, at the secret level, right? So we were working in a skiff. Remember the blue lights that would go off and we were in a locked room. So I'm not going to we obviously we can't show any of that stuff. We're talking about it at a very high level. But it just now occurred to me that this was this was at the secret level, but that was really cool. I mean, all the elements that people talk about with digital twins today is you've got live data or simulated data feeding into it some kind of visual layer where you can go and look at it and understand it, get deeper understanding than you could from just reading log files. And that's the big difference here. A 600x improvement was about these analysts that would sit there and try to read through all this information and try to come up with an answer for can you do this thing or not? And I remember it was, what was it called? Dot MLPF. Yep. Well, we remember this. Department, organization, training, leadership, material, personnel, and facilities. Just got ingrained in me. So that, that was a very complex thing that we did a long time ago. And as you pointed out, we had to build all the individual pieces of it and then put it together and then deliver it to the Army to achieve this objective. So we'll, we'll come back to this. But next I want to talk about our... The submarine, because that was so cool, right? And I actually have, there's a link right here if you uh, folks that are watching want to go and see this. But the, I'm not going to play this video just for time's sake. I'm going to scroll back and forth while you describe what the heck we had to do here. Uh, sure. 688 attack sub. Sure. So uh, we, we took a game engine. In this case, we used the Unreal game engine of the time, and we created a set of yeah, avatars. Epic Games, and, the guy who do Fortnite now, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, the, we took all of the, um, the dimensions and measurements and photographs of this uh, attack sub in the auxiliary machine room you're seeing here, and we uh, created every single valve, switch, indicator, gauge light and made it so that you could operate those things and the neat thing was that they you, yeah you could move them but they were attached to a physics and chemistry and radionics simulation on the back end all coded in fortran that we communicated with 
through some very sophisticated uh, communication channels. This is back before people would say, what's your API? Um, but the, the, the fact of the matter was that you could operate this simulated sub for real. And these guys would get in there and train as a group with a multiplayer uh, experience. They would fight fires. They would uh, deal with emergencies. They would spring leaks and deal with those problems. And they did other things too that I don't know what they did because we were able to execute this project in a hybrid, secret, non-secret mechanism where we created tools for them to author their own content once it left our uh, less blessed hands and, and moved behind the, the careful curtain. And, and it, it was astounding to how quickly you could create experiences and training where you've got people running around doing stuff together for in this simulation of walking and flipping switches and turning knobs. It's like a flight simulator for a room full of gauges and knobs. Yeah, and it was multiplayer, right? So I, I see here it supported up to 32 users. Today, this is called Total Ship Training. Yeah. Uh, and I remember we did that for the littoral combat ship as well when we were at Lockheed and the destroyers. But, you know, they used to set aside an entire ship for just for training. But this is more than training. You can train, you can like do systems engineering um, and uh, just all sorts of things with this. And and I remember building it was really interesting, too, because I had to take a bunch of artists down there to it was Groton, Connecticut or up there, I guess. Uh, and we had to crawl around and like take photos of everything. The other interesting thing that happened there is because it's so, I don't know if most people haven't been in a submarine, but it was so tight in there that uh, we were using this wide angle, was it a Sony lens camera? Yep, it was. And we found out there were some aberrations or some problems in the lens. So what did you do to solve that problem, Ken? Well, uh, so the, it turns out that the uh, the lenses distorted the images so that it was very difficult to un undistort the images and come up with the dimensions of things accurately. So it uh, turns out I have a background in optical equations, and so I was able to reverse engineer the distortion of the lens by taking some pictures of a grid, did a little bit of math uh, experimentation and, and come up with the equations for the lens and, and uh, get everything nice and rectangular and square. And then we could get out our tape measures and make it look accurately real. That That's the kind of, uh, you know, agility that I really appreciated working with you over the years is, hey, whatever the problem is, let's just figure out how to solve it. If we if we have to invent something, then we'll invent something. <laughs> and And we did. So uh, anyway, I, I think this is really interesting. We're working on all kinds of things today. We're doing a university now, which I don't think we have the clearance to talk about yet. But again, the university thing is, again, you know, can we improve upon human understanding operationally from a training perspective or whatever by making a digital copy in a simulated world and playing around with how we view information, how we fuse information together? So. Just talk, don't mention the, the university yet, but just say at a high level what you had to do there to architect that uh, system. Sure thing. Well, uh, what, what we did is we knew we had a, a geospecific location and we wanted to visualize layers of information on that. And so uh, I've done this enough times that rather than uh, draw the pretty lines on the thing and that's it, I created a framework for putting layers of visualization and, uh, um, and kind of a, a system for call out detail per building. That, that was the charge. They, would, they wanted per building information of, of various types. Um, and so you, you can imagine just, you know, generally speaking, you've got uh, the network traffic and the foot traffic of a building. That's interesting. Um, maybe that's something you'd want to look at from a 10,000 foot view. So you move your view to a 10,000 feet. We made something that kind of looks like Google Earth, but it's got these layers of what's going on. And then you can think about making decisions and doing smart stuff and having conversations about uh, what network equipment should we buy because I'm seeing this or what uh, what should we uh, have the cops go do because there's a bazillion people in this area and maybe we should flow them out of there for a little bit. Um, the, these sorts of 
things that uh, if you can get some perspective, um, that's worth IQ points. And you want to make use of that kind of smarts when you're deciding what to do with a lot of people. Yeah, so talk, talk about lenses a little bit, because that, I think that's one of the issues today. We have everybody's got big data. There's so much information out there. And then you've got to do the transforms or the functions or the or the you know, the the equations which you apply, the math you apply, the computation you apply to that information in order to get intelligence, which is what we're all after, right? Um, but sometimes you need to have a lot of people looking at little narrow pieces of it. Maybe it's because of permissions or maybe just because it's just too much for a human to track. So talk just talk about the idea of lenses for a second. I thought that was a really interesting concept. Sure thing. So uh, great, uh, when we were talking about the army before, there's way too much information in that database to look at all of it all at the same time. So we came up with this idea of putting on lenses. And so you could think of, you know, the the money guys got the green glasses, the uh, the the guys got to keep everybody alive. It's got the red glasses, yellow glasses for the technology people who need to make sure the equipment all works. Um, and and what you what you do is each of those people puts on those lenses in their user interface, right? They click it, and it, those kinds of of points of view, portions of the information, are um, are are visualized in a aggregated set that is smart. Um, and it turns out that that can be extremely powerful because what you're doing is you're engaging the human visual cortex as that last piece of computation that can do all the magical things, but all the heavy lift grunt work of turning the crank to aggregate it all and filter it all, you let the computer do that part. And now you've got this kind of aggregate entity, which is yourself empowered by this lens that you've put on this data set. And when you take those two things together, now the computer that's doing the visualization plus you work together as an algorithm that's beyond either of those two separately. Yeah, like if we if we talk about the you know what I was mentioning earlier about dot MLPF, if each one of those things could be a lens. Mm -hmm that needs to be monitored. So I, I'm, I'm always, when, it, when we were building that, I was always thinking of, you know, in Houston, before they do a launch of a, of a spacecraft, they go, they want to check in with each one of the units and say, are we green or not? And you've got a human being there who's making that decision in the loop. But hopefully, or at least hopefully today, there are a lot of automated systems that are feeding all that information up to the human and giving them the green, the go, the no go, uh, lights, but and it's not just a, humans reading a bunch of streams of information because it's too much for any of us to to track. And I and I think that's the key today is, you know, as our as our automated systems get smarter, we could have a lot of those lenses being monitored just by automated systems, and maybe all the way up to the point where there's an automated system that that is making the final decision. I'm I'm glad we're not there yet. I still uh -huh. think it's helpful to have the human in the loop at the top, um, but. You know, it's it's all happening really fast, and it just feels like though that everything we've done over the last couple of decades in 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 gaming, in simulation, working at Lockheed, uh, working with AI and machine learning, as you and I have for the last uh, eight or nine years, uh, and it's all it's all coming together in one beautiful uh, package that I think is really going to create a lot of value. So, what do you think is next, though? And we. Like you said, we built a lot of these things over the last couple of decades. We had to invent all of the separate parts, but now we can just go borrow uh, good, you know, if there's something better from somebody, we can just take that. Like if Google's GPT-3 or something else works better than what we built, we can substitute it for something we built. But what's next? What's going to be exciting about the next couple of years in this field of digital twins from your perspective? Well, uh, for, for me, uh, my focus is very often on machine learning um, and, and reinforcement learning, uh, AI generally. Um, and so uh, when I look at uh, having a simulation uh, that, that's a twin of something in the real world, and I think about putting a bunch of agents wandering around in that world, 
giving those agents minds, giving those agents some sort of decision making and perception capability, and then letting them become good at navigating that. Lo and behold, you've got something incredibly powerful. And, and, and I mean that very generically, not just walking around, but I mean, making purchasing decisions, um, experiencing uh, advertising, um, experiencing warfare, um, experiencing driving, the, these kinds of simulations, it turns out you can use them to train machine learning and AI algorithms because the new magic of AI, rather than coding something by hand like we had to do, you can solve these problems using AI by saying, here's a world to go play in, a sandbox. Try to get better at this metric. Go. Uh, you have 30,000 years of virtual time to get that done. And of course, that'll be done this afternoon. <laughs> because of the way time works in your, when you're training these agents. And um, the, the kinds of things that could be achieved with projects like that, as long as the purpose aligns with uh, benefit, uh, there, there is a great deal of new things under the sun that could be achieved that I think could be very virtuous. Awesome. Well, my little agent is telling me this is time for, because we're not supposed to go more than 15 or 20 minutes on each one of these. Uh, but we'll do another session soon. Ken, thanks for joining. Um, the next session, we're going to talk about all the other digital twins we're planning on building or have built, including hospitals, cities, uh, retail or, uh, establishments, uh, as well as people. How about the digital twin of people? And I know you, know you and I have worked on that already. So tune in on one of the uh, episodes that are coming up, and we'll talk more deeply about that. Again, it's uh, Metaversal, the Metaversal Minute. Thank you all for joining and uh, see you in the metaverse.